Hello and everyone and welcome to our second installment of our webinar series here at BFG Financial Advisors. Uh, for those who attended last time, it's nice to see you again. And for those that are new, welcome. My name is Cody Niedermeyer and I am an associate at BFG. And I'm really excited to have you all here for our second installment. Today, we are lucky enough to have one of my favorite people in the office. Don't tell anyone, Lena, and those that are watching, I'm sorry. But we have Lena Nebel, who's one of the principal owners of BFG and also has more than 20 years experience in the field and across various topics, including the one that we're going to talk about today. So what we're going to be looking to talk about today is merging your financial worlds and speaking everything from the start of marriage to hopefully not the end, but everything <laughs> in between. But Lena, welcome. We're so happy to have you. I'm happy to be here too, Cody. I'm excited to be talking about money and relationships right before Valentine's Day. So the, the timing couldn't be better. It seems fitting, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, without further ado, I think we should get into it. And I want to preface this by saying that we are going to talk about um, the premarital process and the idea of things such as engagement rings and those tough conversations that you should probably be having before moving forward with marriage. But we're going to spend a bulk of it on when you finally tie the knot, you're married and, you know, those steps that you should be doing. And if you haven't done them yet, you know, maybe it's time that you start having that conversation and taking uh, taking a look back at, you know, your entire financial world and where you're trying to go and accomplish those goals. So what should we be looking to prior to becoming married? Um, I think we should probably start off with, you know, how do we talk with the person that we're we could see our rest the rest of our lives being with them? Yeah, I think that you know before you're getting engaged and obviously you're thinking about spending your life with this person, you want to have a full disclosure of your financial world. It's an it's important to talk about income, uh, debt, savings accounts that have already been established, and you know you don't go on date one and asking well what's your salary. But over time, those are the conversations you want to have. Um, I think we all know um, that a lot of relationships can dissolve because of um, money issues, money problems. And so that a lot of that has to do with the fact that people aren't being honest, they're not sharing. Um, so again, as you're transitioning into that next phase of your relationship and getting engaged, it's important to, to have those conversations. Um, I'm hoping my husband's not listening to this webinar because I know I'm going to share a lot of personal stories and um, in thinking about this topic uh, ahead of time, I started thinking about my own personal situation and I know when my husband and I um, were together for a while before mm -hmm. we got engaged, you know, we would have those conversations and, you know, he had every credit card imaginable from the department stores uh, just to get the 20% off. So we sat down and we closed all of them, cut them up. Um, but those are the conversations you want to have. You you want to be honest. You want to you want to share. If you can't have those money conversations with the person that you want to spend your life with, um, it's going to be tough to be able to have other conversations too. Yeah, and I think that makes complete sense. And I know during our uh, last webinar, when I was talking with Eric Brotman, one of the other principal owners of BFG, we talked about you know there's there's no better time than now to have those discussions. Um, kind of not a joke on it, but I mean, with everything going on with the pandemic and there's not much we can be doing in the world, you know, this is the type of thing where you can have dinner and you can have these talks and try to figure out, you know, what makes sense for the both of you and your relationship moving forward. Um, I guess to kind of an idea of protecting this and, you know, you've come to this conclusion, you guys are on the same page and you're looking to move forward. One of the tough subjects that comes up is the idea of a prenup. Right. and kind of protecting your financial world and protecting the financial world of, you know, that person that you see the rest of your life with, but, you know, times have changed and things happen and people kind of move their separate ways. I guess what I want to know is how do you bring up that conversation? And then if we could break down exactly what is a post up, what's a prenup and kind of, kind of build off those together. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think this is an important conversation to have. And, and probably 20 years ago, you know, a, a prenup was kind of a dirty word because it's, mm -hmm. you know, you're already going into the marriage thinking it's going to fail. So um, people would shy away from having that conversation. Whereas now it's absolutely more common. Um, more individuals are, are becoming uh, more financial uh, uh, literate, 
with a lot of the topics that are out there. So a prenup is now more common than what it used to be. Um, so what a prenup is, it's basically a, a, a document that's laying out the financial agreement arrangements should the marriage dissolve, should that relationship end. Um, and it's a way to protect both spouses. It's a way to um, also protect if there's you know, children involved in the relationship. Um, and then the post snap would be you two are already married. Um, maybe there's a windfall that comes in. There's an inheritance or there's something that changes in your financial world and you want to put that post up together as well. So that's where you would meet with a family attorney, having those documents drafted. Um, each state varies on the rules. So you want to make sure that um, the attorney that you're meeting with is familiar um, and is you know, practicing law in that state, uh, state of residence. But um, both are very important documents. We see prenups a lot in a second marriage. Um, just because assets have already been established and unfortunately that they've already been through marriage number one. So uh, a prenup is extremely important. Um, also, if there's businesses that you're dealing with as well, you want to make sure that the businesses are protected. So that's where those agreements can come into place. If if we were, I'll use myself as an example, and if you need to use anybody, feel free to use me this entire time. I've got no shame, so uh, please bring <laughs> it on. But um Let's say I'm getting married, I get a prenup, I get married, and we're living in Maryland, and you know we pick up, we move to Virginia. Do I have to alter that agreement, or is it good for Maryland? Because I know you were saying it's based on a state-by-state -state basis. No, that's a great question. Um, whenever you change your state of residence, you want to meet with the attorney to see if any of your documents are still valid. There may be something that has to get tweaked, maybe there's some codicil, that would have to be added to the document, whether it's estate documents, which I know we're gonna talk about in a little bit, or it's these um, pre or post nuptial agreements. So anytime you're changing a state of residence, you wanna make sure that everything is up to date in that state. Okay, so basically the same thing as, you know, having that relationship with your financial advisor, you wanna have that relationship with your attorney. So it's, you're not picking up and moving and then saying, hey, I did this you're rather preparing for that situation and knowing all the details before you do actually proceed with whatever action you may be taking, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. So I wanted to start off this webinar, you know, knock out the prenup and the post-nup discussion and then kind of get into some fun, more fun categories of the getting, in mar uh, getting married portion. So your girlfriend agreed to the prenup, right? Uh -huh, and now yep. we're, we're about to get engaged. We fooled her into the prenup, yes. Uh, so we're ready to get engaged. I'm spending my nights I'm looking online, making calls, any family, friends, or anything like that. I'm looking at what some might think the dreaded engagement ring. Um, <laughs> I know there's the old folk tale of three months' salary is what it has to be, and kind of going into that situation, no matter you know if you're at the lower spectrum of a salary versus the higher spectrum, and kind of figuring out what makes sense for you know this thing I want to give my future wife that represents you know my love for her or anything like that moving forward and the idea of how much should i save and what i should be doing when i do actually purchase the ring mm -hmm. um this is usually i think the first time that um couples really talk about finances is when they're actually talking about what to spend on an engagement ring which i, I always mm -hmm. find interesting when when you have that um but first, Cody, the, the size of the ring doesn't describe the love that you have for your girlfriend. Mm -hmm. So that's, we, we don't want to set that expectation. We want to set reasonable expectations of, um, you know, what both of you want, right? Because you don't want to go into debt in having to uh, purchase a ring. I think some people can be a little sticker shocked when they, when they look at that price. Um, on average, an engagement ring can cost around, you know, six to eight thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and um, for some people, that that's absolutely a lot of money. So you want to make sure that you're setting aside money into a bank account. Um, you're, you know, setting reasonable expectations on time frame on when to get engaged, because you don't want to spend everything on that ring when it could be used towards possibly the wedding budget or some mm -hmm. other things that the two of you want to do. Um, also. You know, it's it's a big purchase. It's an important purchase. So you want to be able to protect that purchase. So that's where you want to be able to look at getting it insured. So um, you could have it appraised at the jeweler. Uh, you provide it to your insurance company, and then they'll put aside again a separate policy to help insure that if it becomes damaged or gets lost on your honeymoon. Um, you want to make sure that you have that protection in place as well. But the um, 
the engagement ring, uh, unfortunately, can set the stage for a lot of uh, uh, conversations as you're starting to, to plan the wedding and everything as well. And you answered one of my big follow-up questions is, you know, once that ring is purchased, in, in my mind, I'm going to be thinking about her walking around with that ring on her finger and, you know, she takes it off for something and all of a sudden it disappears. What do I, what do we do? You know, because like uh, if you look at your homeowner's insurance policies, they cover up only a certain little amount that a lot of people aren't even aware of. But right. having that excess uh, insurance based on appraisals is is huge just for the ease of mind and, you know, ensuring that thing, like I said before, would, it's a representation of, you know, the commitment you're making. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it's not just for, you know, the women's ring, but it's also for, um, you know, the, the husband's ring. It could be any ring, quite honestly. And uh, a few years ago, my husband was on the golf course and he basically took off his ring, he's putting on his glove and forgot to put his ring back on. And so he actually uh, a day later went back to the golf course and asked him, you know, did you find a ring anywhere, which I thought was a shot in the dark. Um, but the individual actually pulled out a box of hundreds of wedding bands that guys had lost on the golf course. Um, so it, it literally is like a needle in a haystack. Um, but you know, you, you lose a ring, there is some type of coverage, uh, typically on a homeowner's policy, and there could be a deductible with that, um, but then you're able to go out and, and get another ring. So um, again, for large purchases like that, you definitely want to insure it. Absolutely. And I am sure he was using that ring as an excuse for a couple slices and draws and some <laughs> things he wasn't trying to do on the golf course. But um, so we're looking forward and, you know, we got the ring, we're engaged. And we're one of those couples who, you know, want to move in together before the wedding. And the idea of whether I have my house and she's going to move in with me or she lives in an apartment and I'm going to move in with her. Um, how do you have those discussions about, you know, where are we going to live? How are we going to split those bills? Like, what's the process going to be of us, you know, kind of merging our lives less in the financial sense, but also included, but more just merging our lives of being together, waking up together in the morning and kind of progressing through our day like that. Yeah, I think um, those conversations, you bring up uh, a lot of good good parts because, you know, whether you're you're renting or you're purchasing or you have a house and someone's moving in with you, um, there's bills that have to be paid, right? So who who's responsible for those bills? Is it you, Cody, because you have a house and she's coming in to live with you, so you're continuing to make your mortgage payments and she's just giving you some money for utilities? There's there's a lot of those um, conversations that, again, they, they need to happen before you even move in together. Don't have the conversation on day one of, of uh, living in the, uh, whether it's the apartment or the house, but you also wanna be able to protect each other if, again, it doesn't work out, um, if let's say you two decide to purchase a house together. You know, are you selling a property? Are you um, using your savings to contribute towards that down payment? And if that engagement breaks up, how are you getting your money back? You know, what agreements mm -hmm. do you have in place to be able to protect each other? Um, but it's not just about the rent payment. There's, you know, utilities, there's insurance, there's a homeowners association, there's all of those expenses. And uh, to this day, um, my husband and I joke about how uh, I had an apartment actually just down the road from our office mm -hmm. and he moved in with me. Um, so he would give me money towards rent. And within two months, I think I increased his rent a little bit. Um, so again, you want to have those conversations ahead of time. Uh, I wouldn't recommend getting a joint bank account at this stage because again, you're not married. Um, and again, if you're, you're just starting this process, uh, today, a lot of people have PayPal, they have Venmo. There's very easy ways to be able to transition money, transfer money to and from each other. Um, and I think that's the best thing to do, whether you're paying for rent, mortgage, utilities, et cetera. Um, but the house definitely makes it more complicated just from a titling standpoint um, and how to protect you know, the two of you. So let's take you, Cody, as the example. Mm -hmm. And you have a house and your girlfriend moves in with you and you're together for a few years. You, you plan on getting engaged, but unfortunately, it just doesn't work out. Um, how is she protected with maybe she help to contribute money for a bathroom renovation? Um, how would she get that money back? Those are the things that you wanna make sure that you two have that conversation 
and that you two are both, again, um, you're realistic and you're both honest in those conversations. Yeah, and I guess one of my thoughts about it was, you know, if she, if she were to move in and let's say something did happen to me and, you know, I have my estate planning documents in order and all of that and, you know, she's not on them at this point, which we'll talk about that later as you've already alluded to as well. But, you know, what happens to her if my house is left to my sister or my parents or something like that, all of a sudden she's not covered. She's not on the deed. She's not on anything of, you know, that's not her home anymore. And when you're moving in together, you want to make sure that, you know, it's a home for both of you. Yeah, we see that um, a lot at the office, which is couples who have, you know, been together for many years. There's no intention of getting married, but, you know, they, they share finances, they, they share their roof, um, but the property may be only in one person's name. So it's important to have a document set up on, if let's say Cody, you pass away, um, your girlfriend, your fiance couldn't stay in that property um, for as long as she likes. And here's the responsibilities that she's going to have if she's taking over the mortgage, if, you know, everything else. And then there could be a time period set up with that. Or when she decides to leave, then that property reverts back to, let's say your sister or your parents. Um, otherwise your sister or your parents in essence become her landlord. And if they don't like her, they can just kick her out. There's no protection for her. And, and like I said, too, from a financial standpoint, if she has contributed money towards any type of renovations in that property, how does she get that money back? Mm -hmm. So those are the things that, um, again, they're not fun conversations to have sometimes, but you want to be able to protect each other. And hopefully you never have to um, use any of those documents and um, and it, again, it, it works out and, you know, um, those are the things that we have to talk about. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I completely agree with you. Uh, these are tough conversations that need to happen. Um, the last thing I do want to talk about that I think everybody that's listening is also curious about for those who are not married yet is the idea of, you know, planning for that special day. You know, you've got your dress, you've got your suit, you know, all your friends are coming bachelor and bachelorette parties are done and you know <laughs> it's it's time to really plan and you know make this picture perfect day that you've kind of always imagined or always thought about and the idea of what do we need to do what do i need to save and kind of the ideas of what's important and what's not important for that wedding day i i think you you said it perfectly cody you said that picture perfect day right mm -hmm. it's one day your wedding is is one day. Ideally, your marriage is going to last a lot longer. So careful on how much you know you spend on that one day. And again, you want it to be memorable and perfect, um, but it can be expensive. You know, the average cost for a wedding is around thirty five thousand dollars. Um, in doing this for as long as I have, I have yet to see a wedding that cost under thirty five thousand. It's usually way north of that. Um, and that can be dependent on the culture, the expectations, uh, destination weddings, things like that. Um, obviously, with the pandemic going on, there's been a lot of Zoom weddings or backyard weddings. Um, people have improvised and, and cut down their budgets tremendously. But I think that's temporary. I, I don't think that's going to be the norm. I think people are going to jump back up um, into those higher, higher price weddings. Um, you know, again, just another personal story of ours, um, you know, I didn't spend, we didn't spend a lot of money on flowers, cake, or even my dress. I mean, flowers typically die unless they're fake, and then you just have all these uh, centerpieces, and I don't know what to do with that. Uh, cake is absolutely going to get eaten. Um, and then the dress, you know, ideally, you're just wearing it that, that one time. Um, but what lasts are pictures and videos. So what we chose to do is we chose to allocate our wedding budget more towards the pictures and the video. Um, I know that you know people can take videos on their cell phones and they can live stream, but it's still different. Um, each year on our anniversary, we actually watch our wedding video again. And 16 years later, we still catch things that we never saw. And we watch the video now with our children. And we have family and parents and friends and grandparents who are no longer with us and being able to see that on the screen it's that's there forever and so for us that was important 
And that's the bottom line. You want to plan what's important for the two of you. Um, I think many of us may have envisioned what our wedding looks like and what it would be, but then you have to attach the dollar figure to that. And that can be, again, sticker shock. $35,000 is more than many individuals' one-year salary. I mean, that's a scary number. And you don't want to go into debt to be able to pay for this. So you want to be smart about how to do it. Um, you know, traditionally, I think you know, the, uh, the bride's family would pay for the wedding, but times have definitely changed. They, um, they've changed in, in an amazing way to where a lot of times it's both couples that are contributing. The families are contributing, but the couples are also contributing. Um, I've had a lot of people to where they've given their children a budget and they can use that however they want. Um, I've had clients to where they've said, we'll give you this amount of money towards a wedding or we'll apply it towards a down payment on a house and let the couple choose to you know, set their own budget for a wedding. So they have more responsibility in how they're spending the money. Um, but that's one of the things that we do here for obviously a, a lot of clients is they, they wanna factor in a wedding for the kids. What does that look like? How would we save for it? But for Cody, let's say for you and your girlfriend, you're saving for that wedding. Um, you want it to be important for the both of you. You want it to be magical. You want it to be memorable. Um, but you want to make sure that you can still have fun the next day, that you're not strapped for cash the next day. Um, so keep all that in mind. You guys want to do what's important to you, but kind of stick within a reasonable budget. I, I don't think you can put it better than that because I was going to follow up and ask you, you know, you know is, she, is her dad still going to pay? <laughs> I mean, in an ideal yes, world. Yes, that depends though. on if he likes you, if you've passed the test. Oh, uh, we got we got pests to pass then. <laughs> but uh, I finally I finally made it down the aisle. You know, the I do's. You know, it was a beautiful ceremony, and now we are married. And now is the time where I'm thinking, oh well, I have my checking account, and she has her checking account, and I have this investment account, and she has her investment account, and I think it's important to look at the money side of things as everyone can see on our slides and you know what should i be looking at with you know those bank accounts and possibly consolidating and looking to really merge the financial aspect of our world now that the physical aspect is there as well yeah i i don't think anything has to happen overnight it doesn't have to happen on day one or month one um but kind of coming full circle back to the conversations it, it needs to be discussed on how to handle everything um, it really comes down to trust and comfort level. Uh, you know, for some individuals who get married later in life, they've been financially independent for a long time. It's very hard to um, kind of merge things together and you don't want to do that for the sake of doing it because you're married. Um, so start small and maybe just create a joint bank account to where um, a portion of your paychecks are directly deposited into that joint bank account. And that could be used for whether it's paying bills or saving for other goals that you have. Um, so again, you want to be comfort with the both of you. Um, and you also want to, again, look at the titling. Uh, you, so Cody, you could have an individual account. Your girlfriend has an individual account. You can add each other to that account. Um, you can add each other as an owner, or you could add each other as, let's say, that it's payable on death, which is basically adding a beneficiary designation to a bank account. Um, okay. So those things take time because you just, again, you don't want to kind of jump right in and all of a sudden you're starting to commingle everything. You want to make sure everybody's comfortable um, through that process. Um, what I would recommend, though, is to have one banking relationship. You don't want to have multiple banking relationships because when you consolidate accounts, so even if, let's say, one person banked at Wells Fargo and one person banked at m and you could choose, okay, are we going to use Wells Fargo or m and and still keep your bank accounts separate, but you have that one relationship. That one relationship can help you get better rates on the savings accounts, or CDs, money markets. It can help you get better uh, rates on your loans if you're taking out, let's say, a car loan or a mortgage to buy that first house. Um, so I would say minimally create one joint bank account if you're not comfortable commingling the assets. Um, and then try to uh, have one banking relationship as well. Kind of keep things simple. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. And I guess while you were talking, I was also thinking, 
building on just the bank accounts is, you know, a 401k plan and, you know, my previous beneficiaries, my parents or my sister and everything like that. I mean, now we're married. I, I want those assets. If something were heaven forbid to happen to me to be provided, you know, to my family and my new wife. So how do I go about, you know, making sure that she gets those funds? I know you said you can kind of add a beneficiary to these bank accounts, but what's the process of adding that to those retirement accounts? Yeah, so you want to look at whether it's retirement accounts at work or outside of work. And it's not just retirement accounts. It's also life insurance policies, too, and adding beneficiary designations. Um, I know, like I said, we're going to cover some on the estate side, but it is important to be able to protect your spouse, right? You have potentially a mortgage or you have rent expenses. There could be a difference in your income styles and everything. Um, so, or your income level. So you want to make sure that each of you are protected from that standpoint. So adding a primary beneficiary, also adding a contingent beneficiary if something should happen to both of you. So um, usually updating beneficiaries, it's just paperwork that's involved. It's very simple, but people forget about doing that. So we go through beneficiary designations annually. We look at who those beneficiaries are um, and to see if anything needs to change. Also, if this is, let's say, a second marriage, your um, former spouse could still be a beneficiary on those accounts. So you want to make sure that it's updated to the new spouse as well. Um, but beneficiary designations, again, doesn't have to happen overnight, doesn't have to happen on day one. But you want to make sure that those assets are protected so that um, the money that you've been saving for the two of you, it's not going to your sister or your parents. It's, it's going to your spouse. Yeah. And... I think you might have a little bit more jump in your step to get it done if it is one of those ex-spouses, uh, but everybody's scenario is different. And I think you really just gotta evaluate and get things in order to in order to execute these updates that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But you, you already alluded to the you know life insurance and I talked about the retirement accounts and a lot of those are offered through you know employers and there's certain group benefits and different things like that with employee benefits. And I know if you get married, you know, there's a possibility that, let's say, my now wife works at a hospital and she's a nurse and she might have better health benefits that it would make more sense for me to get on. What should we be looking at in the employee benefit realm and, you know, kind of evaluating when we're making those decisions? Yeah, so a lot has changed um, over the past few years with the Health Care Affordability Act, which is commonly referred to as Obamacare. So some employers could actually assess a surcharge on the um, employee's benefits if they're bringing on their spouse, but their spouse has the option to have insurance through their employer. So again, um, let's take you, Cody, you want to bring your spouse on to your insurance here at work, but she has the ability to get her own insurance. Your employer may charge you extra for the privilege of having your spouse on this plan. Um, so that's one of the things you want to look at. Are there any penalties? Are there any surcharges? You don't just want to compare the cost. You want to compare the benefits as well. Is there a health savings account that's available for one employer versus another? Um, there's also wellness programs that are offered through an employer, whether it's credits towards your HSA account like we have here. Um, my husband's employer would give a reimbursement up to a certain amount for athletic equipment. Um, if you want to have a couple, I mean, if you're a couple and you want to have a family, what does the maternity coverage look like? What is pregnancy consulting? Um, is that available? That can be a, a great resource. So you don't want price to be the, the main uh, factor when evaluating uh, insurance coverages. You want to look at everything. Um, when we engage a new client here at the firm, we're always asking for their for their benefit information. Um, these booklets, uh, you know, they have a wealth of information about the company, of what the company can offer. And most people tend to just focus on, well, what's the health care and do I have a retirement plan? Um, it's unfortunate because there's a ton of valuable benefits that are uh, there that individuals may not be taking advantage of. So you want to again evaluate both coverages, not just the cost, but look at kind of the big picture, and then you can make the decision on, on where you want to go. Okay. Uh, would I be able to get any type of life insurance if I were on her plan? Like, is there so an opportunity for spousal? Yeah. So if you are, if you are married, 
Um, some employers do offer spousal life insurance. It's minimal amounts. It's usually like $10,000 or $25,000. Um, there's no underwriting that's involved. It's typically inexpensive, but it's more advantageous to get that spousal life insurance outside of your employer plan because okay. you can get more for less on a you know per thousand um, insurance death benefit. Um, you would have to go through underwriting. So if there was some type of underlying health issue that would prevent you from getting uh, approved, then maybe you would use the spousal insurance. But traditionally, it's um, more cost effective in getting the insurance outside of your group plan. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So it's really, you know, reading through those fun booklets and really having better understanding of each of your benefit offerings and kind of evaluating and making those decisions on, you know, what makes the most sense based on couple and every couple's individualistic of there's no blanket statement that this is right for you. This is right for them. It's you know, you got to evaluate each one individually. But, you know, as we get further into this year, um, we're getting closer and closer to that tax deadline. And, you know, <laughs> I'm married now and I've been, you know, filing single. And, you know, is is now the time that, you know, I jump and I just say, yep, I'm married filing jointly. Or is there some things we need to weigh against each other and making those decisions as well? Well, if you're already married, you're going to either file married filing jointly or married filing single or separate. Um, that's going to be something that either if you're using your own tax planning software or you've engaged with a with a CPA, a tax preparer, um, they're going to help you make that decision. But it's important to understand that the year you get married is the year that you file that way. So let's say you get married on December 31st. Um, and you made some taxable transactions in the beginning of the year, that's all going to go under that married filing, let's say you're jointly married filing jointly rule. And the reason that that's important is because for some people, there may be certain strategies that they're engaged in. Maybe they're making Roth IRA contributions or they're rebalancing their portfolio. So there's capital gains, but they're in a lower tax bracket. Then they get married and their spouse may have a business, may have higher income, and it just pushed that individual up into other tax brackets to where they're no longer eligible for the Roth contributions. They're paying higher capital gains taxes. They're getting phased out on a variety of things. Um, it can have a big impact. So it's important to kind of talk about, okay, what are the strategies that I'm no longer able to do or um, that I have to change based upon the two of you coming together, especially if there's a big disparity in income. Okay. So it, it really is a look back and, you know, I won't plan on getting married and later in the year now. So thank you for that. <laughs> I appreciate it when the time does come. Um, but I guess I should have started with this was the idea of, you know, we're filing those tax taxes and she has a CPA or I have a CPA and, you know, we're not using one of those services or, you know, possibly even the discussion about the employee benefits and evaluating what's best. And, you know, a lot of that goes over some people's heads and not necessarily not being smart enough to know it, but, you know, just lacking that understanding because they were never really taught it. And speaking with a financial advisor or a CPA, um, should we go to hers? Should we go to mine? Um, you know, what's the best way to evaluate who do we talk to? Yeah, um, you know, I see this frequently in um, second marriages because they've already established relationships with a CPA or a financial advisor. Um, and this can be a tricky one because it, you're dealing with money and money is an emotional topic. Um, and if you're like one of our clients, you know, you develop a relationship with the person who's managing your financial world. So it's best that you and your partner meet with both individuals to discuss your current relationship. Um, for some advisors, they may charge another engagement fee to bring on the spouse. Um, others may reduce the, their advisory fee on managing the money because maybe there's more money that that advisor is going to be managing. Um, in the end, you both want to be comfortable in the process. Um, for CPAs, the cost to prepare taxes may increase because maybe there's more complexity. Maybe there's a business involved. Maybe, maybe there's um, additional investments to account for, rental properties to deal with. Um, so again, having a meeting with each CPA to discuss what that change will look like and making sure that each of you are comfortable. Um, 
I will say, deciding to maintain two advisors is extremely challenging um, because the other advisors really don't have eyes on what's going on on the other side. So there could be taxable events that happen that wouldn't need to happen, or maybe somebody's allocated in an inappropriate way. Um, so it's best that both spouses are involved and working with one advisor for overall planning. That's just going to make everybody, make that process smoother and easier for everybody involved. Awesome, awesome, that really does make sense. And I think just creating that transparency by having that knowledge is, is how you make those decisions. But looking at, I know we've already talked about beneficiaries and kind of touched on the life insurance aspect of possibly a spousal, uh, including employee benefits. How do we protect each other? And oh, I'm sorry, I think I actually went a little bit ahead on these slides. Um, so I'm going to go back. But um, how do we protect ourselves with insurance? And what should what should we be looking at with, you know, life versus disability? Should I be having a discussion now about possible long term care? Or is that going to look completely different in the future? And, you know, we're kind of waiting on options to hear, you know, the best course of action to protect what we're building. Yeah. Um, again, this is those topics where you're thinking of, um, you know, what happens when somebody passes away? What happens if there's some major medical event? And it's emotional and it's hard to think about those conversations, but they need to um, they need to get done. Um, this is a situation with within a month of getting married. I actually um, went through the underwriting process, both my husband and I, to get new life insurance and everything because we were planning on um, buying a house, we were planning on having a family, we were young and healthy, so we knew that the price would be cheaper and we were planning ahead, so we decided to do that. Um, thankfully, that did not scare him away when I was already thinking about life insurance on him, um, but you know, it, it's an important conversation because you want to make sure that your income is being replaced for that other individual. You want to make sure that debt is getting paid off, that you're still able to fund for those various goals and everything as well. Um, so again, whether you're looking at life insurance, disability, long-term care, you wanna be able to protect your income, assets, and also if there's heirs. Um, I know we've been using you as an example and, and with you being young, obviously long-term care isn't going to be on the horizon for you for quite some time, okay. but for individuals who are getting married later in life, that would be an insurance that you would explore. Um, going back to the work benefits, a common benefit that people waive and don't elect is actually short and long-term disability. And the reason that that's so common that they um, exclude that from their program is because everyone thinks, you know, nothing's going to happen to them, right? I'm never going to get into an accident. I'm never going to be disabled. Um, they don't want to also pay for the insurance. I can save a few dollars per pay by not having that insurance. Um, but disability insurance can cover pregnancy leave, it could cover complications during pregnancy, if you have a car accident, if you're out in the water and you have an accident and, you know, um, break a leg or something and you can't come into work. Um, and then obviously right now with what's going on with COVID, disability insurance could be extremely beneficial to have. So while disability won't protect 100% of your income, it's going to provide some form of protection for you and for your spouse. And that income can still help to fund your long and short term goals, can still help to pay for expenses, maintaining standard of living and everything else. I, I had a girlfriend. Um, she, um, you know, her income wasn't that high for them. You know, it was kind of tight and they decided to have a family. Um, she had not elected any type of disability insurance. So she didn't have any of her pregnancy, her maternity leave um, be covered. And it was setting the stage for um, uh, financial stress for the two of them after they just had a baby. Um, because then you don't have that income that's coming in when you wanna take off of work. So again, I encourage everybody, when you go through your open enrollment, um, which are typically in the fall, um, take a look at your disability coverage, see what that short and long-term is. Sometimes it's already there, it's employer paid, which is great. Other times you have to elect it or you can elect additional insurance. So. When you're starting to plan for your future, again, those employee benefits are a huge part of that future. Okay, I, I think that makes a lot of sense too. Um, I guess building on that would be the idea, and I, I keep bringing them up. Eric, last week, uh, <laughs> when we were talking, we definitely spoke about you know estate planning documents, and you know 
as soon as somebody turns 18, you want to get at least a generic something down in order to protect them in case something were to happen. Um, I think this is becoming married is a significant event that, you know, is this the time that we need to relook at everything and, you know, create new wills, uh, powers of attorney, financial powers of attorney, medical powers of attorney, and all that um, is now the time. Absolutely. Um, and again, it's, you know, sometimes people think about, uh, I need to be wealthy. I need to have all this money to have an estate plan. And an estate plan is not just about what happens when you pass away. It's what if you become incapacitated as well. So um, just spending a, a couple minutes on what each of those documents are and, and the importance of it, um, you know, you have a will which is basically just describing who's going to take care of your estate, your stuff. Um, do you want to be cremated? Do you want to be buried? Who's going to be the guardian of any children? Are there stepchildren that are involved? Um, if you bought that big wedding ring, do you want it to pass to a family member? Those You can leave bequests. So again, the, the will kind of describes all of those things that you want to have happen when you pass away. Um, keep in mind though, that whatever you name in the will, um, if you have accounts that are that go by beneficiary designations, the beneficiary designations are going to override whatever the will says. So coming back to my example of you're in your second marriage, your former spouse, your ex-spouse is still the beneficiary on those accounts, but you updated your will to reflect your new spouse and you pass away, your ex is getting that money. That's not going to be a, a healthy dynamic. So you want to make sure beneficiary designations are in alignment to your will. Again, that's something that we always do is when we get a copy of that will, we want to make sure, are there any beneficiary designations that need to be updated? Um, so you want to make sure that the individuals you list um, as your beneficiary or personal representatives, that they're updated across the board. Uh, financial power of attorney is basically who's going to pay your bills? Um, who can access your accounts if you can't do it for you? Uh, we had a client years ago that had a horrific bike accident that ended up in a coma and um, her parents had to petition to the court to be able to have access to her money, to be able to make her mortgage payments, to have questions about her health insurance. Um, so you would want to name your spouse to be able to have all of those rights, especially if you don't have assets titled jointly. So your bank account question, um, your spouse wouldn't be able to, to go into that bank account to help to make those mortgage payments. If you have separate insurance, you didn't go on her plan, um, she doesn't have rights to access your health insurance. So having that document in place is crucial. Um, a medical of attorney and, power, and medical directive, medical power of attorney, um, that's basically you know who's making the medical decisions on your behalf. The same client, again, the family had to petition the court to be able to take control over her body, um, what medicine was getting injected. Did she want life support? Those documents are crucial. Um, they're horrible when they have to be used. Um, I had that experience with my father-in-law where we had to get his medical directive on, you know, are we continuing life support and everything else? Um, but we honored what his wishes were. Um, in that moment, there's so many emotions that are happening. You want to go to that document so that you're fulfilling their wishes. Um, so again, th those are the, the three core documents that you want to have um, in place. And again, Cody, uh, it, it's good you and I didn't get married because again, after the first month I had Joe, we were getting our estate documents done too. So again, day one, we did life insurance and estate planning um, because it's also what I do. So um, we, we, again, we, we got our wills, power attorney, medical directives. And in that medical directive, that's more of your emotional questions. And in there was uh, questions on if you were pregnant and the doctor has to choose between you and the baby because there's some type of medical complication, who's taking priority, right? Mm -hmm. Those are things that you really don't wanna to have to think about, but you need to be able to have those conversations. And once everything's done, you put it away, you don't even think about it until something changes in your life. You have another child, mm -hmm. um, you have an inheritance, uh, an estate tax law change that impacts you. That's when you pull them back out again and, and update them as you see fit. But again, um, Risk management, estate planning, not fun conversations, but they need to happen. Well, 
we've worked our way through the not fun conversation. So I think <laughs> it's uh, I think it's time we uh, we move on to something that's uh, a little happier and kind of exciting. And it's the idea of you know planning for our future and what our future looks like. Okay. Um, I know we've talked about a house a few times, but a lot of times people don't purchase their first home until they are married mm -hmm. and they're looking, you know, to buy that first house. How do we go about planning for that, saving for that? And, you know, what steps do we need to take together in order to achieve that goal? Yeah, I think, you know, the the first step is really establishing the time frame, right? Mm -hmm. Is the time frame the next year? Is it three to five years? Is it 10 years down the road? Um, because that's really going to determine where you want to put that money. If you know it's in the next few years, you're going to stick with the bank account. You want it safe. You want it secure. Um, if your goal is a little bit longer than that, you could look at other types of fixed income offerings that maybe have a little bit more risk, but also can give you a little bit more interest as well. Um, it's also important to not just think about the type of house that you want, but what can you actually afford? So sitting down with a lender to get pre-approval is important. Um, the lender is typically going to have a higher number than what you can actually afford. So bringing in your financial advisor, or if you do that yourself and looking at your budget numbers, kind of throw in what that additional expense would look like. Um, but as you know, I'm recently purchasing a house. It's not just about the mortgage payment. There's moving costs. There's furniture to fill the rooms. There's decorations. There's possible projects that are going to be happening throughout the house. So those are the things that you want to factor all of that together. Um, we made the mistake when we bought our first house that we furnished all the rooms immediately. Um, we bought furniture before we even moved in. And over time, we realized that the rooms, we were using them differently than we had planned on and the furniture just didn't okay. make any sense. So then when it was time to purchase our second house, we didn't take any of that furniture with us. So then we had to buy furniture again and we waited a few months, many months before we decided to fill each room, um, we could have saved a substantial amount of money if we just took our time in the beginning. Um, so th that would be something I would look at when you're purchasing a house. Don't just think of the mortgage payment. Think of everything else that would have to happen with that. But traditionally, mm -hmm. you want to be able to save that money within a bank account, um, depending on the time period of that house of when you want to purchase the house. Okay, and. I guess to build on that is the idea of once again, you know, whose names are going on the deed. We're married now and we're going into this together. Does it make more sense? And is there a protection value um, that could possibly change from state to state of having the house listed as jointly versus, you know, individually in one's name where if something were to happen, you know, could that house be targeted and a suing opportunity for someone after a fender bender on the highway. Right, so there's a couple of different ways in which you can title the house jointly. Um, one uh, titling could be joint tenants by the entirety, which is afforded just to married couples. Um, it's not though in every state, so you wanna look at you know the state specific rules and that's where the titling company can come into play and to kind of help with that. The financial advisor, the estate attorney can also discuss that too. Um, and that's basically a, a joint with rights of survivorship, but for a married couple. So rights of survivorship can be for anybody. You and I could have a property together and we could title it rights of survivorship. And if something happened to you, I receive your share. I'm the owner of that. Um, but tenants by the entirety does exactly what you had just alluded to. It, it protects that those individuals in the event that there is some type of accident or creditor protection, something like that. Um, the other option is joint tenants in common. Um, tenants in common, you sometimes see on a second marriage to where that person's share who passed away actually goes to their estate. So maybe it's then going to their kids. They're passing along their share of the property directly um, to, their, to their children. Um, sometimes it makes sense to title it in the name of a trust for other types of protection. Um, so again, it's, it's important to discuss it traditionally with your advisor and talking about, okay, how are we one funding it? And then how should it be named? Um, depending yeah. on what may happen in the estate world as far as taxes and if there's new laws, um, it may make sense just to put it in one person's name and divide property equally um, versus having everything joint. Okay. And, you know, we finally moved into our new house. We have everything situated. And the fun topic that makes me squirm a little bit to talk about right now is the idea of, you know, 
children and, you know, pursuing that in the future? And what should I be doing? So I think this probably makes you squirm just because it's a sticker shock when you think about daycare. Oh. You know, if you were, you know, having children and you both wanted to go back to work, um, daycare is expensive. And, you know, if your child's a few months old, uh, expect to spend about $1,800 a month. That cost only goes down um, as they get older. Typically, once they hit two, you get a price break. Maybe it's about $1,500 a month. But you don't want to work just to pay the daycare bills. So you want to make sure that your combined income can support your lifestyle and pay daycare and you have something left over. So treat daycare expense um, like a bill. So when you think of your emergency reserves on what you need to set aside, which is traditionally three to six months of your expenses, include that daycare bill as part of, as part of that expense. Um, sometimes it feels like you're going to always be funding for some level because college is going to be around the corner as well. So um, there's other vehicles that you can use to save for college, like a 529 plan. They're tax efficient. They could use it for private education, um, kindergarten through 12th grade, in addition to college. Um, but it's important for the two of you to talk about, well, how do you want to pay for college? Do you want your children to take on some student loans? Do you want them to work? during school to help to pay that tuition? Or do you wanna fully fund that education regardless of where they go? Whether they go to University of Maryland or they go to um, University of Florida, again, depending on the different price levels, you both, both want to agree for what that funding level should be. Okay, and you know we're getting a little close on our time, but I do have one more thing I wanna talk about before grabbing maybe one or two questions that I've received during this, uh, this webinar as we've gone on. But uh, just the idea of long-term goals and, you know, what does retirement look like and, you know, how do we get there? Mm -hmm. So you've brought up Eric a couple times. Um, Eric has a fantastic podcast for those of you who haven't um, listened to it before. It's called Don't Retire, Graduate. And the podcast talks about how to advance into retirement rather than to retreat. And um, both partners need to be present in those conversations. Um, my husband and I, you know, we have a financial advisor here at the office. We get together twice a year to kind of talk about what our goals are. Um, we both want to retire in different places. So we're still working on kind of coming into the middle on where we both want to end up. Um, but it, it is important for both people to be present in those conversations. Even if one person is traditionally handling the finances, both parties are funding and saving for the same goal. So you want to define what that long-term goal is, what is retirement, what does that actually mean? Um, so that, you know, definitely we spend a lot of time in um, kind of pulling out that information mm -hmm. from clients and, and having them think about all of those topics. But in the end, okay. you want both parties there. Okay, and that makes a lot of sense. And I think we got one question from a Mandy and it has to do with, um, I believe she is asking about she stayed at home with the kids and helped raise the kids at home. And, you know, her husband was still in the workforce. Mm -hmm. Are there opportunities for her to continue to save for retirement, even if she is working at home? Absolutely. So this kind of covers a few different topics that we talked about. So the, the first is looking at taxes. Um, since they're married and they're either filing jointly or filing separately, she can use his income to help to qualify to either make a deductible IRA contribution, a Roth IRA, or maybe she can make a non-deductible IRA contribution. Um, some of those types of savings vehicles though, they are limited by income. So if, they're com if his income is above certain thresholds, she may not be eligible to make those contributions. Um, mm -hmm. But in addition to asking about the retirement savings, um, there's many women, um, and now there's a lot of guys um, staying home to take care of the kids. People don't end up um, getting life insurance for that spouse that stays home because individuals look at it like, well, there's no income that I'm protecting. But if let's say in uh, Mandy's situation with that question, something happened to her, well, who's going to take care of those kids? Do we have to now fund for daycare? Do we have to have somebody to come into the house to help to take care of the house? Because if you don't have that person, then her spouse may have to stop working. And then we have a loss of income from that side. So even though there is a spouse that's staying home, you still wanna protect them from a life insurance standpoint. And there's still a lot of opportunities 
to be able to put money away to for them to be able to build up retirement savings. Okay, I I think that definitely answers that question. Uh, we have I think we got time for about two more, so let me pull one more. And we have uh, when we were talking about estate planning documents, mm -hmm. where should those be kept? Something happens to the house, and you have your one will in the house, it's gone. You know, where should we have copies of those? Should we give them to our kids? Should we keep them in a certain spot? Um, I guess they want to pick your perspective on that. Okay. Um, so depending on who does the estate documents um, will also help to answer that. So let's say you okay. meet with an estate attorney, they draft all the documents for you. They're going to have a copy. More than likely, they're also going to register it at the courthouse. Um, so that's absolutely going to happen for the attorney having the copy. Mm -hmm. You want to give it to your personal um, uh, parties, your responsible parties. So let's say your executor would have a copy. And then it's always good to give it to your financial advisor as well. So th okay. those would be the, the main individuals. If let's say you did this on your own, you went online and you just kind of put together some documents mm -hmm. and everything, had it notarized, you know, you would have a copy. I would still give it to your executor. Um, and then there's a lot of tools now to where there's online vaults that can be accessed. So whether it's through your financial advisor or through your own, you know, kind of up in the cloud, um, that's where you want to make sure that those documents are, but you want to let people know where they are as well. So that's why giving it to your executor is important. Anytime you update that document, though, you want to make sure that you provide an updated copy. Okay. Giving it to the children is a little tricky, depending on the relationship that you have with the children. So um, not all children are created equal. Uh, there could be some that aren't going to handle money well, and you may incorporate a trust for that one person, whereas the other children are getting money outright. And if they have a copy of that will, you know, emotions can get involved. And so sometimes that's not the best idea. Um, so I would leave it up to that individual's, you know, personal preference, their comfort level, when does it make okay. sense. But minimally, I would say either some type of online storage facility, your financial advisor, the estate attorney, and then of course your executor, your responsible parties. Okay, and last one we got for today is how often should spouses be having these financial conversations, I guess, as an entire view of what we've talked about today? Um, the short answer is, you know, regularly, um, I would say minimally two times a year that you wanna go through that process. Um, but obviously, if there's job changes or raises or bonuses, home projects, large purchases, goals, new children, you know, all these different things that are going to come up, um, it's important to have that conversation. You know, when you go through open enrollment, that's a great time to have that conversation just to make sure there's no changes, nothing that you need to plan for. Um, but I would say at least two times a year, I, I made the comment that my husband and I have a financial advisor here. We sit down with her and it's a great opportunity to share what's important to both of us. Um, many times advisors kind of be a, a marriage counselor in talking about individuals' goals because that's sometimes the first time the couples actually talk about what their plans are, right? I mean, you're going through your, your job, you're taking care of kids, you're doing everything day to day, you're not thinking long-term. You have to take the time for the two of you and think about what that future looks like. and um articulating it to each other so like i said we're still trying to figure out where we want to retire to because we can't yet come to an agreement on that one so hopefully in these next 15 years we would have uh, agreed which means that he agrees with me i was about to say <laughs> uh, along with everything else we've learned today i'm sure you'll uh you'll win that one as well but mm -hmm. uh i can't thank you enough i really appreciate you coming on and you know talking with everybody i believe on our next slide we have your contact information but I just wanted to say thank you. I think you provided a lot of great information for a lot of people today, and it is appreciated. Thank you. No, thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. And just for all the listeners, we really appreciate you guys tuning in. Um, we hope that you're able to take some things from this webinar and are looking forward to the future ones. Uh, we have another one coming out next month, and it's going to be with Eric Brotman. Um, but as a thank you for you guys tuning in today, uh, you're going to receive a follow-up email. It's going to have a recording of this for you to share with anybody you think could uh, pull some value from it. And there's also going to be a reflected discount where if something we said today um, interests you and you know you guys want to have a conversation about you know the possibility of moving forward with a, some sort of financial advising or just have some simple questions for us, 
please send them in. Um, thank you all again, and uh, we'll hopefully see you next month during our next webinar. Thank you.